Hello and welcome to Join News Prime, live from our studio here in Accra. We're live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125, and around the world on myjoyonline.com. Coming up in this bulletin, two more military takeovers suspected in the West African sub region before the end of 2023. Meanwhile, Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagbing says there is a potential danger of civil unrest if steps are not taken to address the root causes of agitations. Also, onion traders losing over 200 million cities as supply trucks get logged up at Burkina Faso and Benin borders following Niger's coup, raising concerns about shortage and price hikes. Or not backtrack in passing law to protect our cultural identity. Sponsors of Ghana's anti-gay bill not deterred by World Bank suspension of new loans to Uganda after the East African nation passed anti-LGBTQ plus law. There are increasing fears over more coups in West Africa as a member of the ECOWAS parliament says there is a possibility of two more military takeovers before the year ends. Emmanuel Bejra, who is also a member of parliament for the whole West constituency, says the prediction was made by experts during the sittings of the ECOWAS parliament. Niger's elected president, Mohamed Bazoum, was ousted at the end of last month, and the coup leaders have since resisted diplomatic attempt to resolve the crisis. Because, you know, this our president, they decide to you know, pick people who are loyal to them, especially right. from their tribes. Right. And he mentioned that, and I, I, it, it took me aback. And I said, well, it is because we are not including the military hierarchy in decision making when it comes to political decision. Who's supposed to be your presidential guard? Is it your brother? Is it your family member? Or you just pick people from the military setup and form your presidential guard? Check out from Burkina Faso to Guinea, uh, Conakry, to Mali, and Niger. They are all presidential guards. And so we are beginning to fear that this movement, four of our neighbors, four of our brothers, who are no longer members of ECOWAS because of the sanction, will affect us economically, militarily, mm -hmm. and every sphere of our life in the region. Okay. So, it is not today it is it is it is it is in Niger. And from the analysis that given us, we have two more to go. Two, the end two, of this year. two more could it task to, to be witnessed? Yeah. Could it does to go, and that should be a worrying trade to all of us. In fact, from all the speakers who came to talk to us, we have two more military personnel and uh, two could it does sub region to go before the end of the year. And so, this should be a, a worrying trade to all of us, whether we agree or not. We had it last year, Abuja, and mm -hmm. just happened. And now, they have predicted that there will be two more. Okay. And so now, Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagbing, however, says mistrust in the democratic process is giving rise to tension and civil disobedience in the Ghanaian society. The upset of insurgency activities around the country's borders has put Ghana's intelligence agencies on high alert following military takeovers in Mali, Burkina Faso, and recently in Niger. Addressing the public forum on 30 years of parliamentary democracy, the Speaker said the military may not intervene, but there is a potential danger of civil unrest if steps are not taken to address the root causes of the agitations. We all hear that the space of development cannot match up to population growth with a resultant high rate of unemployment and its attendant security risk and instability which we are witnessing. There are so many others I could add. But let me tell you that because of this, the reversal of democratic gains in Burkina Faso I used to visit the president of Burkina Faso and the parliament and speakers. I used to go there. And I was able to link a number of businessmen from Ghana to their partners in Burkina when I was deputy speaker. Look at what is happening there. Almost about 70% is being controlled by terrorists. So they run the schools, they run the health sector, they, they, they do everything there. No government is there. Mali, Guinea, and Nigeria. 
These are not palatable narrative for the profile of our sub-region. It's as a result of this that the trust and confidence that voters had in democracy have been trumpeted. And that is why some of the earlier speakers said some people are preferring military rule to the democracy we are practicing. Now, the Africa Center for Global Engagement and Diplomacy, Afro Global, is calling for a diplomatic approach devoid of foreign involvement in dealing with the Niger coup and is concerned a credible ECOWAS led intervention could be undermined. Afro Global says there are reports of over 1,500 French troops and 1,100 US troops present in Niger and questions in the event of an ECOWAS led intervention, what would be the role of these foreign troops? How would their role undermine the image and independence of ECOWAS? The center warns military solution has never had a predictable outcome. Uh, Doctor, uh, the Afro Global is therefore calling on regional leaders to be cautious of the involvement of foreign powers in the ongoing process. Dr. Ismail Horvo is a research fellow and associate director at uh, Afro Global, and he joins us via Zoom now. Doc, I'm grateful to you for joining us. What are the concerns about the role ethnicity plays in this crisis? Yeah, thank, thank you and good evening to your viewers. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, we are so concerned about trying to find a solution to this crisis through the military approach. As you rightly said, uh, the military approach uh, has never had a predictable outcome. You may estimate that you'll go there in three days and come out, and you may end up staying there for uh, longer than expected uh, if you face uh, nationalist resistance. And of course, in terms of ethnicity, we have observed that in Niger, uh, there's a kind of ethnic undertone that the course is not paying attention to, where the Austed president is seen as of Arab. Uh, ethnic minority group, and the uh, incumbent seems more like a native uh, who has assumed power. Now, when these dynamics come to play, then it means that in the event of a military intervention, the military regime may well decide that they will arm civilians. Now, so when civilians are armed, then you have a situation that you have to confront these civilians. Now, even if you succeed in um, removing the coup leaders and reinstating that the elected president, then you now have the tax of trying to reconcile that society. So, because of course, those who carry arms, uh, atrocity will be committed and so forth and so forth. So you, you have to find another way of reconciling that society. So we think that given the, the, the stakes, uh, given the, the, the difficulty you will find if you, you, you enter militarily and then civilians become armed, and that may also open room for the terrorist groups that are already operating in the region, mm. because then every group will, will try to find a niche for itself within a state of confusion. So we are concerned that ECOWAS should pay attention to some of these dynamics okay. and rather resort to the diplomatic process. Mm. Now, how about the economic or financial cost of an intervention on the sub region? Yes, of course, uh, intervention will not be free. Uh, they are not going to intervene with uh, 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 they are going to intervene with weapons. So mm. and these weapons have to be paid for. The personnel that will be deployed have to be paid for. The question then is who pays? Because if you look at the sub region, most of the autonomies are struggling. Ghana is, uh, uh, as we well know, is struggling. Uh, we we are trying to uh, go through uh, debt restructuring and all manner of things, and we are we are struggling. Our central bank is in distress. So. Mm. You are, the question then arises, who pays for the intervention? Because all the economies that are left within the equals, because some of the members are, are under sanctions, so they are out. So the remainder, who pays for it? And if you are going to commit resources in, uh, to, to financing war, and you leave uh, crucial things such as provision of social infrastructure, then you open room for more of these takeovers, because as you commit resources to a kind of intervention and neglect domestic issues such as youth unemployment and so forth and so on. Then you give room for other military takeovers because the, 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 the cost is actually not uh, the coup as you 
are seeing, the focus mm -hmm. is actually other issues such as unemployment, such as insecurity within the region. So if you are going to deploy military resources, you should be deploying them to help the countries that are facing terrorist attacks, the countries okay. that, that are terrorist seeds. Your resources mm -hmm. should be doing what, 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 But what, what, if you are going to commit resources to mm -hmm. uh, just a, a real force, Doc, let's look at the role a country like Algeria can play in this. How can they help and why must it be them? Yes, yeah, so uh, we think that mm. from the start, Algeria has been quite uh, uh, um, friendly to, to the coup makers in terms, in, the, in terms of fact that they have not supported the military option. They have mm. always believed that the diplomatic option will work. So if you look at the Equals members who are calling, who have uh, threatened that when they are pushed to the world, they will go for the military option. Then you think that Algeria, who, who has always been against the military option, stand a better chance of negotiating with the with, with the coup leaders than uh, a country like Nigeria, which okay. uh, the president has clearly uh, demo, uh, demonstrated that he is strictly against uh, uh, the, 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 coup. The, the coup maker. So mm. in that case, Algeria may be easy. To, to use to speak to the guys and then we will understand what they need and maybe we can have um, a compromise solution where the austere leader uh, comes back to power and the military guys have some say and then we return to civilian and have a timetable for uh, 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 fresh elections okay now you're also recommending an engagement with powers like russia and china why that is very important because if, when you impose sanctions sanctions works when major power major trading partners and uh, cooperate within the sanction regime so mm -hmm. as equus has imposed sanctions one of the things that we have observed in the south region is that most of the coups immediately the coup happens then they they, they align with russia under some of the restrictions that we impose on them mm -hmm. so it is important for equus to engage Russia and China, because traditionally these powers uh, have the non-interference principle. So regardless of who is in power, they will consider the coup as an internal affair, so they will not intervene, and therefore they will continue to support and, uh, and provide aid to this regime. So when you engage them, then you make them understand the collective position of equals. Then you isolate them, providing any help to, to, to the regime, and that will help your sanctions work more effectively. Than it, without engagement. So if you look at uh, uh, um, Burkina Faso, you look at Mali. What they have done simply is that once you impose sanctions and the Western nations uh, withdraw, then they move towards uh, uh, Russia and, and China, who traditionally would not want to be seen uh, intervening in somebody's mm. domestic affairs. So mm. in this case, as a group, we need to engage them and let them understand why it is necessary that we we choose this path. And being the group, then they may listen to us and then. That will mean that if they don't provide any form of assistance, if they don't provide any form of help, then the sanctions may effectively work against the regime. But if okay. they okay. provide mm. help, if they provide aid, mm. then your sanctions may not work. Okay. Now, let's look at France. What role can France play in finding a solution to this unrest? Uh, we believe that France has, is, is a party to the dispute. Indeed, some of the one of the causes of this crisis is mm -hmm. that as uh, foreign troops were moved from other part of West Africa to Mali, there are people within the military and the general society who are not comfortable with the presence of these troops. And if we see clearly, um, the demonstrators who were supporting the coup, some of them were actually holding Russian flag as a counter to to to, to French influence. Okay. So clearly. Uh, France seems to be a party to the dispute. So we believe that one of the ways France can help is to restrain itself from, from any equal solution. So okay. it becomes a, a purely African solution. Because mm. if France continues to act as if it's part of the equal uh, 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 solution, solution, then it may undermine the, 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 the African okay. approach that we, uh, we are looking for. All right. Grateful to you, Dr. Hover, for joining us. Let's still stay with the impact of the Niger coup because over 200 million cities worth of onions are stuck at Burkina and Benin due to the closure of their land borders following Niger's coup. The delay of the supply tracks numbering over 70 has many onion importers worried. 
these vendors who rely on the trade say they may not be able to recoup what they invested in buying the produce. The, the once bustling Ajin Kotoku onion market is now left with empty bonds. Some of the traders spoke to my colleague Jackie and Soma Yeboa. The close of the border has affected us a lot because we buy or we bought onions and we've loaded. We have over 75 cars standing on the border and it has affected our business. Since you can see the market, it is empty, simple because of the cool. So it has affected us a lot. Okay. And has there been any price increase? Because last week I was in the market and I realized that there was a slight increase. But how has it been today? Yeah, the price has gone up somewhat because last week we were selling 1,200, 1,150. But now we are selling 1,400 and 1,450. Yeah, yesterday that uh, they've talked to the ambassador and they open, they've opened the border, so some of the cars are on their way coming, but they didn't reach yet. Okay. Yeah. And how much do you think you'd be losing in terms of cost? Because last week, that was last week, and it's been there for long. Yeah. How much do you think you are going to lose as a result of this? Uh, really, there you know, only it's a rotten goose, yeah. so unless it comes. But we know by all means we will lose, we will lose a lot because we know plenty will spoil. And since if it is spoil, by all means we have to reduce it. We will not get the price that we bought there. And we have to reduce it and sell it. So we will lose a lot. So um, do you think the prices are likely to go up if the this price, continues? The price is already go up. And now we are selling it. The, the literature of the brand are selling it at 1500 and Beni Boda, last two days, they opened it small and the colonials come and they have locked it again. And a lot of the cars go in Chuk at Burkina. So about 45 cars are blocked in Burkina about five days now. And they said they will do escort up to now. So our life is miserable. All our money, if you come to the market, your life a graveyard. So it's not easy. And the little they bring to the market, we are selling 1,001. 1,200. Now it's 1,005. And it's not even more. It's the local one that they have a small that they even bring to the market. Now, to other stories now. The World Bank says it is halting new loans to the Ugandan government after concluding that its anti LGBT law, which has been condemned by many countries and the United Nations, contradicts the bank's values. Homosexual acts were already illegal in Uganda, but Anyone now convicted faces life imprisonment under the new law, which was enacted in May. The World Bank said it was committed to helping all Ugandans without exception to, quote, escape poverty, access vital services, and improve their lives, unquote. The Washington, D.C.-based lender said on Tuesday it would pause project financing pending a review of measures it introduced to protect sexual and gender minorities from discrimination and exclusion in its projects. Let's share with you the full statement now. Now, uh, the statement says, quote, Uganda's Anti-Homosexuality Act fundamentally contradicts the World Bank Group's values. We believe our vision to eradicate poverty on a livable planet can only succeed if it includes everyone, irrespective of race, gender, or sexuality. This law undermines those efforts. Inclusion and non-discrimination sit at the heart of our work around the world. It continues to say that um, uh, the, immediately after the law was enacted, the World Bank deployed a team to Uganda to review our portfolio in the context of the new legislation. That review determined additional measures are necessary to ensure projects are implemented in alignment with our environmental and so social standards. Our goal is to protect sexual and gender minorities from discrimination and exclusion in the project we finance. These measures are currently under discussion with the authorities. No new public financing to Uganda will be presented to our board of executive directors until the efficacy of the additional measures has been tested. It says third party monitoring and grievance redress mechanisms will significantly increase, allowing us to take corrective action as necessary. 
The World Bank Group has a long-standing and productive relationship with Uganda and we remain committed to helping all Ugandans, without exception, escape poverty, access vital services and improve their lives. That's uh, the statement for, from World Bank there. Now, the Ugandan government has dismissed the move by the World Bank as unjust and hypocritical. Its ambassador to the United Nations called the move super draconian. In a tweet, Ambassador Andonia Ayebare says it was time to rethink the World Bank's work methods and the board's decisions. Now, the tweet reads, this is whimsical behavior by at World Bank towards a member state. The values referred to in taking this draconian decision against Uganda are not universal. They are contested. This makes the case for reform of work methods, including the board more urgent and pertinent. At Kaguta Museveni and at Robbie Kakonge uh, underscore. So that's the statement coming from the ambassador of Uganda to the United Nations there. Now, what does this mean to Ghana's effort to pass the promotion of appropriate sexual, sexual rights and family values bill? Joining us with some answers is one of the proponents of Ghana's anti-LGBT plus bill, Emmanuel Kwesibedra, who says the World Bank's action against Uganda will not deter them. I'm grateful to you, Honor, for joining us. First, World Bank deciding, uh, uh, you know, says Uganda's anti-homosexuality act fundamentally contradicted the World Bank Group's values. Isn't it then right to punish Uganda for enacting a law that contradicts those values? Well, uh, good evening to your cherished viewers and listeners as well. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, my brother, it doesn't, uh, I don't see it as anything that the World Bank world necessarily punish Uganda for passing a law that the Ugandans or the parliament of Uganda, including the president of Uganda, uh, ascended to it as a law that would safeguard their culture norms of that country. And therefore, uh, for, a, for an institution of, of World Bank is uh, World Bank structure, uh, you know, asking that they should, they will not give additional funding to Uganda is, is neither here nor there. Mm. Having said that, I, I believe as the, the minister, uh, no, the ambassador said it was draconian and whimsical. I believe that it is draconian. It should not be allowed. Was the only Uganda that has passed this law? No. We have uh, countries like um, Hungary, you know, passing laws that are supposed to be anti-homosexual law. What has World Bank done to to countries like you, uh, Hungary? Has has have they done that to Uganda, uh, Hungary? Why is it that Uganda? Is, is now being targeted because of the law that has been passed. Mm. So, so you feel this is discriminatory? So that uh, um, Honorable Kwesi Bejra, we are trying to, um, he's still with us, we're trying to rectify the line so we can have a chat with him. He is one of the proponent, proponents of Ghana's anti-gay bill, uh, which is in Parliament now. Uh, we want to find out from him uh, whether or not, and he says they are not deterred by what uh, World Bank has done to Uganda. Um, uh, Honorable is back with me. Uh, Honorable, so... So uh, that, that we're, we're trying to rectify the line. But in, in the meantime, let's move on to another story where the Wale, Wale, Wale Nalerigu Road in the northeast region has been destroyed by heavy rains. Several passengers have been stranded the whole day and hundreds of people in at least three villages have been displaced by floods. In Tinguri, the heavy rains have caused the community dam to collapse. The rain is said to have st started at 4 a.m. Wednesday. Some residents have been speaking to Elias Utanko. As you can see, if they didn't come and block it, dry season will not get water to build our houses. Our animals too will not get water to drink. So we are appealing to the stakeholders. Anyone who can come to our aid, we are pleading, please help us. If not, this year we will not find it easy. At the nature of the bank of the bridge. In a term, a bridge it, a dam is taking a major role at this nature. The particular bank should be used properly, materials constructed, so that it can withstand the pressure of the rain. 
instead of leaving it at local material like this, that one is making it easy to cost this. Because if contract to so I came out and I saw that the bridge and even the river, the river ban has been washed off the bridge. And you see that the bridge has also broken down and everything. And also some of some people's farms has been destroyed. As you can see, a lot of farms have been destroyed and some people's houses have been broken down. So please, uh, if the government can come to our aid and then help us. Now, the Member of Parliament for Asawasa constituency has assured commercial tricycle operators in Kumasi of its preparedness to lead a peaceful demonstration against recent regulations to restrict the operations. Muntaka Mubarak says this will happen when ongoing deliberations with the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly to review the ban of Pragyat from the Central Business District failed to yield positive results. The MP's intervention halted long hours of street blockade at Abuabo in protest of the decision. And Ayajima has more in the following report. Some commercial tricycle riders on Thursday blocked Abuabo High Street in Kumasi to protest operational restrictions by the Metropolitan Assembly. Motorists and commuters were left stranded in traffic as leaders of Zongo communities attempted to restore order. The riders have been facing off KME since the decongestion exercise in the central business district of the city kicked in last week. It took the intervention of the member of parliament, Muntaka Mubarak, to clear the protesters from the streets. The MP who agrees there is need for the city to be decongested believes bylaws should be enacted to regulate activities of the riders. Muntaka Mubarak has since called on riders to exercise restraint as his office leads deliberations the KME. Mr. Ramo, you didn't pay for your cassay. Not just a Yanzo and the ones are here, Basa Basa. You are. I am pleading with you to exercise restraint as we deliberate on the directive. I want you to stay away from the CDB as we continue to deliberate with them. And I'm going to be fast to ask Ramo, sir. A friend there, what will be a Fiadano? I'm going to be a Mongo. On Monday, I will come back to you and give you the resolutions from the meetings we'll be having with them. If there is need for us to proceed on a peaceful demonstration, I promise you, I will join you for that. The MP is pushing for legalization of commercial tricycles to enhance regulation and expand business opportunities for the youth. We cannot continue to be like ostriches and pretend that they don't exist without proper, proper regulation. So I think that if the government is dragging its feet in trying to amend the, 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 the law, because it is when you legalize it that you get the opportunity to streamline how it is used. I mean, it is almost in everywhere in West Africa. If you go to Asia, it's almost everywhere. Even those countries that seem to be so-called developed, like Malaysia and the Singapore and this, you see, find these things there. Why is it that they've allowed it to be there? Because they realize it and they take the opportunity to regulate it. Looking at the ages of those who are there, look at the very, very young guys, very energetic guys. We don't have to drive them to a point where they feel hopeless. Because it is hopelessness that drill countries. Meanwhile, the riders have resolved to halt the agitations and restrain themselves from plying the CBD. Public relations officer for the Pragya Okada Drivers Association, Al Asbat Al Hassan Sidi, reveals preparedness to help city authorities enforce the regulations. We will try to go back to try engaging the uh, Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly Authority on how they will carry their exercise. As they said, they will continue up to Friday, up to Friday. So since now we have advised our people 
not to go to those areas. So I think we have to go to them and assist them so that at least we won't hear any, we arrest this person, we arrest this person to extend it to amount to any chaos or any brutality anymore. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. Just yes, watching Joy News Prime, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. And let's return to the World Bank and the Ugandan story because the World Bank says it is halting new loans to the Ugandan government after concluding that eight anti gay law, which has been condemned by many countries and the United Nations, contradicts the bank's values. Homosexual acts were already illegal in Uganda, but anyone now convicted faces life imprisonment under the new law, which uh, was enacted in May. Uh, so we're asking the question, what does that mean uh, for, for Ghana, which is also on the process of enacting its own laws. Emmanuel Kwesi Bejra is one of the proponents of that law, and uh, he says they are not perturbed by the World Bank's actions against Uganda, and that will not uh, deter them. Honorable is with us on the light. So um, you were talking about why you are not bothered by this development. Why is it so, and why should people believe that, well, we cannot be bothered by this action by the World Bank? Kojo, uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you for reconnecting me. Uh, yes, we are not bothered at all as uh, members of the, uh, the group that uh, brought in the private members bill to parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, you should understand that uh, every country is a sovereign nation. We all have our laws and our regulations that uh, governs us as a nation. And Ghana is not an exception. We have our rules, we have our norms, we have our culture. Uh, um, desires in this country. And the desire of the people, as we know from the uh, surveys uh, conducted in this country, shows clearly that Ghanaians are not ready uh, or they are not in any way ready to accept any other form of sexual uh, interaction apart from what we know as the, the normal uh, sexual interaction between man, male and female. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we came out with this bill, we did not just you know, start the deal. But we, we also conducted our own survey. We went around, we, we spoke to our constituents, and we asked them whether it is, uh, for us, it, whether we, the Ghanaians who accept it, for us to continue or we should change our laws. And things that we, one of the things that we heard was clearly that our culture does not permit, you know, any form of sexual interaction uh, from any, any quarters. And therefore, we should go ahead uh, to, to, to come up the law. You mm -hmm. also know that interaction from your own media house with Ghanaians will tell you clearly, will show clearly that Ghanaians are not ready for any form of sexual interaction or what we call a lifestyle of, of people, lifestyle preference or sexual preference of people who think that uh, what God has created, they are not interested in me. They want to bring in their own form of sexual desire, sexual preferences. Mm -hmm. And so we know that Ghanaians are supporting us. We are, we are fully aware that whatever the outcome will be as we pass this law, as we see in Ghana, whatever the outcome will be, Ghanaians are fully prepared and we will stand by the law just mm -hmm. as Ugandans will stand by the law. Mm -hmm. This, Nikojo, should tell us that we should not be dependent on international institutions like the World Bank or IMF and the rest. Currently, as I spoke in the morning, as I as inform you, Ghana is at the crossroad. We are in debt crisis. We don't even have money. So why don't we use this opportunity or time to begin mm. to reformulate our own plans and desires as a country so that our eco economically we can stand on our own, not depending on any other foreign aid or other institution to support us financially? Why can't we do that? Currently, we have to go to, run to IMF for a bailout. Okay. Okay. Because we're not able to support ourselves. So why don't you by now begin to draft the law legislation and make sure that we can be self sufficient, we can have we can raise revenue by ourselves and manage our own economy than depending on somebody dictating to you that go ahead and have to move to or go ahead and man should marry another man, a woman should marry another woman or have sex with animal and, and so on and so forth. 
that, and they are telling the Ugandans that it does not conform with their own conditions, their own laws, their own norms as, as an institution. It okay. just tells us that we should be careful with okay. those institutions. All right. Grateful to you for joining us here. Um, Honorable uh, Bedra is one of the proponents of Ghana's anti-gay bill. Now, Germany is facing a growing housing crisis. In major cities across the country, potential renters are finding it harder and harder to find a place to live and paying more for it in the process. Uh, Emily is with our uh, sister station, um, DW, in Germany, and she joins us. Emily, what's happening in Germany's housing market, and, and when did things start to change? Well, experts estimate that the current housing shortages in Germany are higher than they've been in the last 20 years. So the situation has become quite intense. And this is something that definitely hasn't happened overnight. It's been a number of years, even really over the course of the last decade, that we've seen slowly the number of available apartments not match the demand for those apartments. We've seen, as a result, the number of uh, the price of those apartments rising rapidly and on average a german has a, a monthly salary of about 2100 euros and spends about one third of that on rent and these days with prices rising you're seeing people starting to get increasingly squeezed financially because that's the incomes are no longer rising along with housing prices mm. why has the situation gotten so bad At its heart, it's an issue of supply and demand. You have, right now, far more people looking for apartments, trying to find affordable places to live, than the number of affordable apartments available to them. And that's due to a number of reasons. In, in a city like Berlin, where the situation is, is particularly bad, you see a huge number of people moving to the city. Uh, you see, in the last couple of years, you've had a number of refugees coming from Ukraine and elsewhere. And altogether, that means that there are far more people competing for the same apartments that existed beforehand. So so experts have said that in the coming years, the gap between the supply and the demand for apartments could reach 700,000, uh, which is significantly higher than it's been in recent years. The German government has said that what it wants to do to ease the situation is to build 400,000 new apartments per year. And thus far, however, they've, they've fallen short of that goal, and it looks like they will fall short of it again this year. Mm. What's unique about German's approach to housing? There are a few things that I think contribute to this and, and, and are, are really part of why it's a unique situation. One of them is that in Germany, far more people rent their homes or apartments than, than own them. So across Europe, the average number of, or the average proportion of people who own their homes is about 70%. In Germany, it's just 46%. And in cities like Berlin, it's even significantly lower than that. And so that means that people are much more susceptible to shifts in the in the apartment and the housing market than they would be if they owned. Uh, the same thing is true of the fact that Germany has had a very significant subsidized housing market. And in, f in recent years, you've seen fewer buildings that are subsidized by the government, owned by the government, lots more private landlords who have been raising the rents uh, at, at a higher rate. And so all of that contributes to the current situation. All right, Emily is with our partner station DW in Germany. Now, the MPP flag bearer aspirant, Kwabana Ejapon, has admitted that Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and Alan Chamanting are the front runners in the race by default. According to him, both aspirants have had visibility in government, hence, it is expected of them to be taped to win the elections. Mr. Ejapon, who is a former general secretary of the MPP, said, though he does not believe in political polls, he has fought hard and his message is resonating with a delegate which makes him confident of winning. He spoke to Evans Mesa on PMS Press. Right now, I think, yes, it is fair to say there are two front runners. One, because I keep saying that is by default. And politically, the vice president is number two and wants to be number one. Electorally, Alan Chomating, my senior brother, has been second to um, Nanado in the previous three elections, so wants to aspire to be number one. So, of course, they've, they've had visibility, they've been in government, so that is to be expected. But you are the first of the ten yeah. 
that I've had, and I've interviewed many of them on the show, who admit that they are two front runners. But of course, I mean, it's, it's... And, and you don't put yourself in the two. What happens is that the media has been cultured to believe that, and they have been presenting that. But I have fought very hard. I mean, coming from, I would say, deep under the ground. If you believe the two are front runners, why, why, why in the race then? Because if they're front runners, they're front runners. No, no, it you, doesn't you, matter. You know? I mean, I've told you, underdogs win. It's happened many times so in the political. You concede you are an underdog. I'm, I'm, what is important is underdogs also win. It has they, happened several times. When they I was do. Contesting, when I was contesting, I submit John, to you. When I was contesting, not, say, not John, in Ghanaian politics, very I was rarely. Not given a chance. Look at all the polls. Nowhere near. But I wiped him off the slate in Tamale. So I have experience in this. And I do know that the party people, they recognize hard work, the reward, values, dedication, sacrifice. Let's watch Johnny Prime or a 10 with showbiz. Yes.